Now, please welcome Charles Martin. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see everybody here, and, and thank you for coming, and thank you for not reading. Um, I, I, some of you may have heard, I, I, uh, Tim O'Brien and I were at the first uh, conference 30 years ago, and we, are, we have survived, and we are now at, at this conference also. Uh, we are relics, but we're first-class relics, I assure you. Uh, I wish, I, 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 I would like to say that I had the foresight back then to, to uh, imagine what this would have, has become. I'm not sure that I did. I wasn't all that foresightful, but... Uh, thanks to Wyatt for the last 30 years, this has uh, developed into an amazing institution. And uh, I am grateful for his friendship, his steadfast friendship, for being his occasional colleague and his sometime, uh, uh, well, he was my editor sometimes. So. Um, but he is a person of great kindness and integrity. And at this moment, I know what he is thinking. He's thinking, stop this and get on <laughs> reading. Thank you, Wyatt. And I wish Leah have, uh, to have 30 more years as good as the first 30. So <clears throat> It probably won't surprise you to learn that I don't remember what I read 30 <laughs> years ago. Uh, the playlist has disappeared. But uh, I think I, I can speak for two poems that I'll, I read back then and I'll, I'll read now. Am I audible? This is... Okay. Thank you. Just audible is fine. <laughs> this is called Complaint of the Night Watchman. And I think it, midway through the poem, it becomes clear where the night watchman is employed, if not sooner. The tower they are building turns to speech, narrows almost to nowhere nearing completion. The builders have no grasp of their tower's reach, and more fall silent as each new addition leaves them all left with less and less to stand on, becoming fictions with each winding story. It wasn't this that the builders had planned on when they imagined for themselves the glory of this unparalleled erection, a tower that would rise to heaven, making man divine. But they ignored or perhaps had forgotten the power that merely human speech has to undermine godlike achievement, grave misapprehension, now word of Babel, that is their name for it, flies on the four winds and every vagant, vagrant mention brings news of their inflated claim for it to heaven, where this pleases not at all. The gods confer about their grand delusion. They do so even now. It must soon fall, and those who bu who'd built it fall into confusion of language and the race of builders scatter. With them will go odd pieces of the rubble to stand for failed unity and of more matter, tongues that will turn their failure into fable. And um, this poem is called A Happy Ending for the Lost Children. Um, and it's a version of the, the story of Hansel and Gretel. One of their picture books would no doubt show the two lost children wandering in a maze of anthropomorphic tree limbs. The familiar crow swoops down upon the trail they leave of corn tolerant of the error of their ways. Hand in hand, they stumble into the story, 
bright-eyed with beginnings of fever, scared half to death, yet never for a moment doubting the outcome that had been prepared long in advance. Girl saves brother from oven, appalling witch dies in appropriate torment. Her hoarded treasure buys them their parents' love. As happy an ending as any fable can provide, squawks the crow who had expected more delicate morsels from the witch's table. It's an old story. In the modern version, the random children fall to random terror. You see it nightly on the television. Cameras focus on the lop-eared bear beside the plastic ukulele shattered in a fit of rage. The lost children are found in the first place we now think to look, under the fallen leaves, under the scattered pages of a lost children's picture book. But if we leave Terra waiting in the rain for the wrong bus, or if we have Terra find at the very last moment the right train, only to get off at the wrong station. If we for once imagine a happy ending, which is, as always, a continuation, it's because the happy ending's a necessity. It isn't just a sentimental ploy. Without the happy ending, there would be no one to tell the story to but the witch. And the story is clearly meant for the girl and boy just now about to step into her kitchen. Uh, hold on a second. rather than thumbing my way through the books looking for what I was going to read. Um, uh, I am kind of a, a pessimistic optimist or an optimistic pessimist. Um, and there are things that I think we need to be very serious about. Uh, but I try to imagine a happy ending simply because I have children and grandchildren now. Um, I used to take my children to a museum in Vermont uh, called the Fairbanks Museum. Um, and uh, it, it, can, it was full of all of those things that people brought back to Vermont from their travels. And one of the things was this gigantic polar bear in a glass case uh, with a sign on front. And the sign said uh, something like, you know, polar bear shot by Cat Commander so-and-so, US Navy, uh, Juneau, Alaska, and the date. And I went back a few years ago, and there was another little card that said endangered species. Um, so this is about getting, it's called getting carded. We couldn't know what we would lose when the endangered species sign began to turn up in our zoos. A small white card propped up on a shelf in front of the cage or pen of one selected for this honor, translated from its habitat into a compact modern flat. By what endangered or by whom, it couldn't know until too late. One day it woke up in this room where it patrols compulsively the borders of its shrunken state and stares at what it cannot see, far dominions, other powers. Its glance keeps on avoiding ours. You wonder why it didn't learn, although quite frankly, 
it seems not even to share your mild concern. Time to move on. The fourth grade class behind us wants to claim our spot and press its faces to the glass. We leave endangered and its text and wonder who'll get carded next. <laughs> short poem. Uh, it's nice to have a couple of short poems. This is called Arapacus Pacus. And it's the uh, uh, Latin uh, term for altar of peace. In Rome, there's a monument, an Augustan monument, and it, it shows a bunch of people in white togas heading off to sacrifice. And along the side of the monument, there's an ox and there's sheep. And you can see the sheep are saying, hey, we're going out. We're going somewhere. Uh, and the oxen is thinking, this is not going to end well. At any rate, this is our apocus. The white procession halts at the altar of peace to give thanks for war ended on such splendid terms. And someone deposits a shit-stained lump of fleece on the high marble table where it writhes and squirms, unquietly bleating, legs slapping and flailing, and any prayer of its will be unavailing. Some friends have recently moved to Brooklyn, and the experience of living in Brooklyn these days is very much different than it was when I lived there. And uh, This is a poem called Brooklyn in the 70s, and it's a kind of uh, just a sort of casual bit of autobiography. Brooklyn in the 70s. In all the years that I lived there, I doubt I once imagined there would come a time when I would learn that I had been priced out of Brooklyn's 19th century sublime. Back then, it seemed much likelier to me that I would see my small investment go belly up, taken by the undertow of our increasing urban anime until the shrinking figures shrank to north, a zero for the brownstone I had bought. Yet I persisted. Property comes with the fictions by which it's inhabited. I lived in not a brownstone, but a myth about a brownstone, as I often said. Brooklyn was where I'd wanted to debut, the cozy, safe, but always edgy home I didn't quite succeed in coming from, although the Brooklynites I later knew shared memories that helped me to restore a childhood that I hadn't had before. For Brooklyn is, or was then, all about the joys of restoration and repair. A brownstone, once the fortified redoubt of feuding gangsters, or the unkempt lair of junkies, went from shooting gallery to showcase in, let's say, eight years or ten of tearing down and building up again, with never any kind of guarantee that spouse or partner would be standing by there at the end if just to say goodbye. The other outcome happened quite a lot in those days. Many couples would discover that one was satisfied, the other not. The one who wasn't would take on a lover or take off suddenly for parts unknown, leaving the one who was self-satisfied and putting one's now outgrown self aside, for self-discovery meant moving on to find what would suffice and might fulfill. One couldn't find oneself by keeping still. 
I knew two sisters who had left their order, and when I asked what made them both decide to venture out into a world much weirder, it was the stillness mainly, one replied. People began to ask us what we thought of clergy getting married in the pill. We hadn't thought much of the, such things until they started asking us. Soon we were out and living here in Brooklyn where you find us, the other said, where other vows now bind us. Yes, selves were in a frenzy of commotion and those beyond their expiration dates were being tossed despite years of devotion. So whether by one's doing or by fates, one found oneself in an unlikely place. And back then, Brooklyn more than filled the bill for sheer unlikeliness. In Clinton Hill or Bedford Stuyvesant, and with a face one hadn't chosen, one was soon immersed in a role which one hadn't yet rehearsed. The role may have been unimportant. All that mattered was it couldn't be defended by older people. Was what one might call unscripted, improvised, and always ended at a goal which, once reached, would no more seem to be the end one had so long intended. The coach stopped, the door opened, he descended. Beyond such twaddle lay another theme, rich with the still unriddled mysteries of life in Brooklyn in the 70s. Um, I'll read uh, some poems from my new book called Future Perfect. Uh, Future Perfect got, a, uh, it was reviewed quite recently, and the review was sort of favorable, but um, <laughs> the, the first sentence had a certain kind of ambivalence to it, which I'm still puzzling over, and it, it said, except for currently being alive, Except for currently being alive, Charles Martin is not a poet of our time. <laughs> I, th I think the reviewer was simply pointing to a problem which will be solved eventually. <laughs> Um, that was my response to it, yeah. Um, I seem to feel that it was okay not to be a poet, but I like to think that maybe, you know, I mean, uh, uh, some of the poems are, are maybe have, have some kind of connection to the time at which we are all living. Um, I'll read, uh, some of them clearly don't, but uh, this is a poem called Letter from Komarovo, um, uh, 1962. And uh, in, in 1961, uh, the American poet Robert Frost went to uh, the Soviet Union on a goodwill a cultural exchange kind of thing, cultural visit. And uh, uh, he apparently, Kennedy assumed that he was going to go and read some poems and uh, uh, Frost thought that what he would do would be to sit down and talk with Khrushchev man to man and straighten them out and end this Cold War nonsense. Um, and somewhere along the way, uh, he was taken to uh, uh, Dasha in Komarovo, which is a suburb of what was then Leningrad. Um, and uh, he met the, the uh, Russian poet Anna Akhmatova. And at this time, of course, Frost was 
uh, the, just about the most famous poet in, in America. Uh, Anna Akhmatova was living in poverty. She had been thrown out of the uh, writers' union. Her son was uh, a, a kind of hostage. The authorities were threatening to send him back to the gulag. Uh, and she was lying very low. Uh, um, and uh, they met, and uh, she didn't know uh, how much he knew about her. He knew virtually nothing about her, uh, but she had read his work in translation, which had been published in the Soviet Union. Um, and um, I was sort of fascinated by, by, by the encounter. Um, uh, and wrote this poem. And it's a poem in which Anna Akhmatova speaks uh, about her meeting with Frost. And it's based on a letter that she actually wrote uh, to a friend. Um, it, at the end, there's a reference to the prize. Uh, in 1962, they were both on the very short list for the Nobel Prize, uh, which, as it turned out, neither of them got. Uh, but the, the rumor was that one or the other was going to get it. Uh, and in 1959, uh, of course, Boris Pasternak had gotten the prize for Dr. Zhivago, and he'd been told if he, uh, if he went to Sweden, he would not be allowed back. So that's in the background of, of this. <clears throat> Two opposites. It's Anna Akhmatova speaking. Two opposites, each in a wicker chair, Grandfather Frost and I. Could our nations not have produced a less unlikely pair of poets unlike in their situations? That almost sounds like something he would say, given the chance, a chance he would be given with all the honors that have come his way. Did he imagine that I really live in the Dasha where he found me? Or understand what my life has been like? Wasn't it clear that our meeting had been wholly planned by those in charge? Could I have said, my dear, you are your president's honor-laden guest, the apple picker picking one last apple before you sleep? My writing was suppressed while yours received all that a grateful people could offer up to someone not yet dead. All fame, all glory, accolades, distinction. My poems cling to their lives by the thread of memory, fraying toward the extinction they've been rehearsing as the years went by, when no one was allowed even to mention my name in print and my poems and I cooperated to avoid attention. Some still exist, others have been burned by the responsible organs of the state, or were copied out and given to be learned by those who could be executed later. You've always had the freedom to make free, and yet you write as though somehow you hadn't. The strong are saying nothing till they see. But over here, the strong are always prudent. For long ago, the strong learned not to speak until the strongest raised his hand and voted. Theirs is a concentration that the weak, whose speech may be ignored as it is noted, can somehow never manage to achieve. The weak are free in their own estimation and may smile back at smiles meant to deceive or note the censure in the long ovation. But here we are, two poets of our time, each one a cipher really to the other, two old people, practitioners of rhyme, sitting in our wicker chairs together. Perhaps we're not all that on that oh, sorry, perhaps we're not that unlike at all. The curtain that so long ago descended on our age is now about to fall after the toasts and banquets have all ended. 
It said that we are both up for the prize. Let him have it then. My doctors have forbidden me to travel. My health, you see. They advise especially against the trip to Sweden. <clears throat> One of, uh, somewhere in the process of putting the poems together for the book, I got interested in, uh, again, in Weldon Keyes, the American poet who, uh, uh, committed suicide in 1955 and began writing uh, some of, there were some poems that came out about, <clears throat> about Weldon Keyes. I'll read, uh, I'll read two of the short ones. Keyes was very fond of villanelles, so this was the last resort of Mr. Keyes, a villanelle, and it has a, a uh, an epigraph from one of his villanelles, a wind that ushers winter chills the beach. The fun house had closed down the day before and Keyes was saying with a weary sigh, it wasn't all that much fun anymore. So what I wondered had he gone there for and what, if not a weak economy, had closed the fun house down the day before. He said, we'd simply lost that old rapport we had once with obstacles. As time went by, they weren't all that much fun anymore. Still, he seemed disappointed by the shore whispering into empty seashells. Why had the fun house closed down the day before? Nostalgia will demand that we restore the laughs, the boffo gags, the hokey shry, which aren't all that much fun anymore. Did I see keys outside the fun house door holding a sign that read, the end is nigh? The fun house had closed down the day before. There isn't all that much fun anymore. <clears throat> um, Keyes was a really brilliant letter writer, and uh, I, I uh, found myself uh, just fascinated by one of the letters, which he wrote to a friend shortly after he came to New York, a guy from the Midwest came to New York and suddenly found himself going to parties with all of the people he had been reading, Philip Robb and Dwight MacDonald and Edmund Wilson. And, and it was like uh, an instant kind of hero dropping, uh, hero worshiping, name dropping kind of thing. And he wrote a letter back uh, uh, about a party that he had attended and uh, the strange thing is that it is interwoven with this very uh, terrible story uh, uh, um, about a, a murder that uh, took place. And uh, I, I decided I'd try to translate it into a poem from a letter. And when I finished, I went on to the poetry website and was looking around and um, to see what they had about Keyes, and I discovered that there was a young uh, poet who had just finished her collection of poems based on the letters of Weldon Keyes, and I thought, well, that ends that. But the local library had a copy of it, and I went tearing off uh, and, and looked through the book, and my letter wasn't in there. <laughs> Close call. <clears throat> um, I, there are just too many references to, to uh, if you've, um, I think this audience is probably gonna get most of them and, and if you don't recognize a particular one, you'll know it's somebody who you might read <laughs> or you might have read and forgotten. Uh, it ends with a reference to Auden and to uh, uh, Christopher Isherwood, who at that time was off translating the Gita in Hollywood. 
with his uh, uh, his guru. Mr. Keyes goes to a party. Anne is uh, Keyes' wife. Mr. Keyes goes to a party. The Wilsons had just moved back into town from summering on Wellfleet's Money Hill. Edmund was in a very grumpy mood, and Anne, who hadn't ever met before the author of Axel's Castle and much else, was shocked a little by his crabbiness. There were two people whose names I didn't catch. It turned out one of them was Philip Rice of the Kenyan Review. I spent half an hour trying to figure out just who they were. Wilson repeatedly called Philip Rice Mr. Wheelwright. Unable to surmount his own confusion, he demanded, you are Philip Wheelwright, are you not? Which may be why Rice asked me sotto voce, is everybody crazy in New York? Mary McCarthy was busily explaining who the real heroine of the Golden Bowl is, while Natalie Rav told me what all was wrong with Dwight MacDonald, and an argument broke out behind me over the correct pronunciation of Randall Jarrell's last name. Wilson burst out with accent on the last syllable, adding that Jarrell was just, quote, an adolescent whose infantile obsessions were all that made his poetry worth reading. The Wilsons left the party before we did. We left with Rice and the man whose name I'd miss, although I'd somehow learned he lived and taught in Philadelphia. I asked him what he taught. Until this spring, I used to be the head of Romance Languages at Haverford. My wife was four months pregnant with our first baby, and then she shot herself one day. Now he spends Tuesday evenings with Auden. It seems that Auden's in a bad way, too. Issue was off in Hollywood, translating the Gita with his guru, who's a swami. But what he really wants to do, of course, is write a novel about Hollywood. Christopher, said our new, still nameless friend, was fascinated by the last tycoon. <clears throat> um, in the last few years, I have been uh, involved in a lot of uh, editing and prose writing projects. And maybe because of that, I've been doing, uh, I, I've been writing short poems. And I became uh, uh, fascinated again by uh, uh, the Rubaiyat stanza. Uh, the, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam was one of the first books of poems I read when I was an, an adolescent and, and uh, loved it. Uh, so I've been writing these poems in the uh, Rubaiyat stanza. Um, I don't know how exactly, I, I've been trying to figure out how to read them. They're, they're mostly disconnected, uh, and I don't know if I've got the proper, the, the right order for them, or if there is a right order for them. They tend to be kind of aphoristic and maybe a little bit didactic, and uh, but they're not, they're nice and short. So if you don't like one of them, it's going to be over very soon. <laughs> and uh, the longest sequence I think is three together. So you know, hardly anything at all. So I will read a selection of these. It's uh, the title that I've given it is. Uh, uh, second mouse, second mouse. So you'll have to wait till the end uh, for that one to come clear. Um, I sing the, this is a sequence of three. One, I sing the virtue of incertitude whose nimble footedness does not preclude commitments freely given but allows 
for exits likewise taken and unrued. Two, resilience deserves a word or two, if only for the way it gets you through the very worst of it without a thought of giving up those who depend on you. Three, so I praise resolution qualified by flexibility, stone wall beside tall grasses bending which way in the wind. But that's almost a haiku, Omar said. Not, not, no sequence here. When I look in on one who looking out mirrors my gestures, all of them, without any apparent workup or reflection, I cannot help but harbor a small doubt. Five, do we discharge or resurrect the pain we cannot help but sing of once again? Opinion, as you might imagine, is sharply divided in trope maker's lane. Six, when you and I heard Heraclitus claim you cannot dip your foot twice in the same river, we nodded in assent. Then why is our Hudson known by just one name? Long looked into, your mirror will at last give back not just your present, but your past. As for your future, you'd do well to leave a generous tip for the encomiast. <sighs> Sequence of three. Eight. The well-braced window and the hand-held stone are wary neighbors till the one is thrown, the other shattered, and the tousle-haired child of impulse waits barefoot, all alone. Nine, what of that child alone upon the beach, his jaws clenched tightly to repress the speech, uprising in his throat, in his bald fists? I think he is already out of reach. 10. According to Rabindranath Tagore, the children who are playing on the shore between two worlds in the ever-present will go on playing there forevermore. 11. The constant discipline employed rehearsing his death might just as well have been spent cursing the life that he so ardently avoided, the losses there could be no reimbursing. 12. Live all you can, though if you'd rather not, it's no big deal. The house takes all you've got, whether you see or raise or fold face down. No way that you can clear off with the pot. 13. You can't imagine that you'll skip away with nothing left undone, no more to say. Your unaccomplished actions and unspoken words constitute the death debt you have to pay. It's what you call, owe for living on, on the earth. A clock began its ticking at your birth and keeps on till, well, you won't hear it stop. A blessing that would be for what it's worth. 15. The shadows drawing near come to remind you not of the one life that you'll leave behind. You will not leave it. It will go with you. But of all those you sought and could not find. They gather round you in a sullen ring like relatives who won't get anything from their rich uncle's will. But even so, these unlived lives are worth examining. 17. No intimation of the life once led from swaddled infancy to final bed ever, so far as we can tell, disturbs the newfound freedom 
of the lately dead, 18. Nor do the recently deceased respond with a transmitted signal from beyond the grave to any of our importunings. There is a one-way severing of the bond. And the last one, leap before you look, say those who seize, while others rising to the moment freeze. Although the early bird may get the worm, it was the second mouse enjoyed the cheese. I'm going to, I'll conclude with a poem in uh, seven parts, uh, a kind of, it's a, 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 a kind of sonnet sequence. Um, the sonnets are 16 lines in length and they are kind of, they are couplet sonnets. Um, and they, the last line of each sonnet uh, becomes the first line of the next, and the last line of the poem uh, is the same as the first line of the poem. Tricky. Um, it's called From Certain Footsteps Found at Light Holy. Uh, and, and I guess this would sort of back up my reviewer's claim that I am not of my time because this, the action of the, the poem takes place three million years ago, <laughs> um, so, uh, such as the action is, I guess. Um, three million years ago, a, a, a small, probably family group of Australopithecuses uh, went walking in Lytoli in Tanzania, and uh, their they were recorded in their walk uh, by stepping through um, uh, volcanic ash, which later uh, hardened over and was covered up and disappeared. And a student of, of um, uh, Mary Leakey um, uh, discovered the, uh, the trail that went on for about 75 feet, 80 feet or so, and um, recovered it. Uh, it. It was dug up, it's been copied, and it's been buried again so that it does not, uh, it can't be stolen or defaced in any way. Um, so this is kind of about the, the uh, a brief walk taken three million years ago. Uh, I think I could justify it as, as a poem of our time because it's only been in our time that we learned how deep a past we have, uh, how deep a history we have. So this is from certain footprints found at Lytoli. One, we may imagine they still stroll along, singing perhaps their wordless little song. The female smaller maybe than the male, and yet another with them on the trail that leads them either to or back from water. The child who may be this pair's son or daughter, as though to measure up to herself grown, steps into footprints that are not her own. Their tracks laid down three million years ago abruptly end in 80 feet or so, the record of their outing being kept by the volcanic ash in which they stepped, heel before toe, as they went on their way, doing what they might do on any day. And if the course they chose wanted correction, their path extends in only one direction. Two, their path extends in only one direction 
and etched into its interrupted section are indications by which we discover sizes and shapes, lengths of stride, whatever aspects successive footprints may reveal. A depression in the far side of a heel shows that the female carries extra weight on one hip altering her normal gait. What but an infant can be made of this? And then abruptly something seems amiss. She halts, pauses, and turns left. Does she sense a difference that makes a difference? Her momentary doubt is one we share, though without knowing what has stopped her there till she continues. We watch while they recede before us now as signs we've learned to read. Three, before us now as signs we've learned to read into and out of, it is they who lead and we who follow haltingly to trace the lineaments of their unhurried pace, our feet stumbling as theirs impress the warm ash with recovered carelessness. Heel before toe, heel before toe, until the trail is discontinued. Nada, nil. Since they were there once, once almost in sight, if not quite ever there, no, ever not quite, we may imagine that these four continue at the same pace on to another venue. And at that moment, they all disappear, and what is left of them found only here on the path they ventured out upon and quit as soon as their footsteps had created it. Four. As soon as their footsteps had created it, rain and another ash fall on the site turned into muck that turned into cement and made their casual passage permanent in printed code that no one had an eye for or mind until much later to decipher. So could the path be said then to exist? Not till a young paleontologist out of a welter of competing spores, hyenas, wildcats, rhinos, and wild boars saw in apparent isolation what could only be the print of someone's foot, and then a set of footprints that extended for 80 feet till suddenly it ended, and with it closed off what had been revealed at the beginning of another field. Five. At the beginning of another field, behind him, the female burdened with a child, and at his feet, the one who sometimes tries his footprints on for size, impatient to get on with it, instead of waiting while he probes what lies ahead for any sign of a better than even chance, the odd turn that will favor their advance, some reassurance I cannot imagine. Whether or not a countersign is given, they must soon realize that if they linger here, they will put their issue into danger. From now on, unrecorded in the dust, the four of them will go forth as they must, and then, if not before, will slip out from whatever I can say for sure about them. Six. Whatever I can say for sure about them, we, like as not, would not be here without them, without, them having, without their having set out on their way at a certain hour of a certain day some three and one-half million years ago on a quest whose purpose we can never know that brought them here where, without meaning to, they left some trace traces of their passing through. 
these traces I have come upon and made much of, and if my much making has strayed from whatever in the future comes to be thought to have happened, no apology. For errors inescapably are us, the certainty that starts life as a guess, the accidents that generate the plot. We wouldn't be quite human were, were they not. <clears throat> Seven. We wouldn't be quite human were they not, however small and far away, one dot in a row of dots that when connected shows a line, a path, a trail of steps that goes from there to here by which we may infer we are what has become of what they were, as they have been an early state of us on a path once broken, now continuous. We may imagine them, their walk begun one terrifying morning when the sun was hidden in a cloud of ash and soot and how they had to walk completely through it until quite suddenly it all came clear. And as they walked on slowly with less fear, the smaller one took up their wordless song. We may imagine they still stroll along. Thank you.